the sermon was long enough so he decided to add to it I appreciate that as any good preacher would I guess I appreciate very much all the kind words prayers that have been offered for me uh, during the time of my surgery I'm going to turn this fan on just a moment I was told that I was being stubborn this morning wanting to preach after having had surgery on Friday, but I w wanted, to, uh, wanted to do this. It's a lesson I have been working on and one I wanted to present this morning. I hope that you're encouraged by it. You notice in the King James it says the word is uh, hidden in my heart or hid in my heart. Other translations say laid up. I, I like the New American Standard here. Uh, the word, Hebrew word, can be translated in many different ways. Kept secretly is another way that it can be translated. But I, I like the New American Standard here where it says, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. We're going to look at each verse, 11 through uh, 14, and we're going to take them point by point. And then um, I'll also have some things to say about 15 and 16 that have been added this morning. Treasure. I don't know what you think about when you think about treasure. I put what most of the world thinks about there in the, that picture that you see there in the bottom right-hand corner. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, in verse 19, Jesus talks a little bit about this concept of having worldly treasure in, in people's minds and hearts instead of what they should be having in their minds and hearts. Beginning in verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this is the idea that our text from Psalm 119 has. What do we treasure in our heart? What do we hide there? What do we keep secret there? And so we need to get rid of this earthly treasure and not think of that anymore. But instead, we'll concentrate on what the Bible tells us. We concentrate on the Word of God as our treasure. To treasure God's word in our heart is what we should be doing as Christians. It should be a part of our daily lives. Indeed, it is what we should turn to every time that we make a decision in our life. How is it that God would have me to be in this particular situation? No matter what it is, I firmly believe and know from Scripture that when we have a right relationship with God and His word, then the relationships in our life will be right and good because we'll base everything upon what we do on what God has instructed us and how he has instructed us to do it. If we start breaking down the verses, first there in the second part of verse 11, the psalmist tells us that I may not sin against you or that I will not sin against you, some translations say. The idea is that when our life is centered in the Word of God, in fact, in Jesus Christ and His Word, they will focus on that and not of the things of this world. And so our life will be such that I am so focused on God, I am so focused on His Word, that I will not let temptation enter into my life. Now we know that this is impossible to do perfectly. 
We cannot do it perfectly, but when our focus and center of our attention is God's Word, it makes it easier to resist the temptations that are out there. In the book of 2 John, I believe that should be chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Evidently, when you have eye surgery, you also get dyslexia. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. There are two laws of pardon that God has given us as humans. The first law of pardon is when we are baptized into Christ and all of our past sins are forgiven us. They are remitted. They are gone away. God remembers them no more. But as we continue to journey through this life, we will, from time to time, commit sin against the God of heaven. And we must then have an avenue of forgiveness, and God has provided that as well. In the first chapter of 1 John, he tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sins. And then he goes on to explain to us there in chapter 2 that we have an advocate, Jesus the Christ. He is the perfect advocate for us because he came to this world and lived and died as a man, but he was also 100% God. So he is the advocate, he is the mediator, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 to 6. He is also the mediator for us. And so we can know that Jesus knows what we go through. He was tempted as we are, and yet without sin, Hebrews 4 and verse 15. We can under, Jesus can understand what we go through and therefore can plead our case for us to God the Father. That's what the advocate does. He can t- tell the Father that he understands, and we are forgiven because of the, the blood of Jesus Christ. He covers our sins. That word propitiation means that he covers our sins for us. He takes away the shame of sin when we are willing to repent and ask God for forgiveness and it says we can know him we can truly know him if we keep his commandments I would suggest to you we do that when we treasure the Word of God in our heart we treasure the Word of God in our heart then we can resist the temptation of this world in Psalm the first chapter verses 1 and 2 it says how blessed how happy content is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. One of the things that we challenge our youth in the camp this year is to study the word of God more. And one of the examples that was given to them is when you, when you have a song stuck in your head, is it a secular song or a hymn from church? And I believe Andrew brought that out in his lesson a couple of weeks ago. I want you to think about that yourself. When you are going down the road, what is it that you think about? Do you ever stop and think about the things of God? Do you think about a particular passage that you may have heard or read recently? And think about what it means to you. That's what the psalmist means when he says, I meditate upon your word day and night. He thinks about God and he thinks about the things of God so that he can stay right with the God of heaven. Point number two from verse 12. Verse 12 says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. When you treasure the word of God in your heart, you'll want to praise God. And not only that, you'll desire 
you'll diligently desire to learn from his holy word. In Psalm 119, later in verses 64 and 68, the Bible says, The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt with well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Do we ask God to give us wisdom? Do we ask God to teach us from his holy word? And then do we go out and study it as we're told in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15? My translation says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. We might glance over that particular part. We're asking for God's approval, or we should be every day. Do we do what is necessary to get that approval? Part of that is to study his word, to show ourselves approved to God, King James says. As a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth or rightly dividing the word of truth, that passage is one that we should think about every single day. Be diligent. We understand what it is to be diligent in a secular sense, to be at work every single day, to do the best we can at that job, whatever our job is. We get that. We get that as human, human beings, and, and we know we're going to get a paycheck, and a bigger paycheck if we do a really good job. How much more should we, we want to be approved by the God of heaven than we are by secular things? Part of being approved by God is doing our secular job correctly. But certainly part of being approved by God is to study his word, to treasure his word in our hearts. What is your heart? Think about that. Remember when Brother Shepherd was here and he said, let that marinate in your mind for a minute. Where is your heart? What is your heart? Because there's something in your life. I don't know what it is. You know what it is. And you think, that has my heart. That has my full attention. That has everything that I am. I'm focused on that. Whatever it is. If it's something that brings you great joy, is that something the word of God? The psalmist said, I treasure your word in my heart. His heart wanted to be pleasing to God. Does yours? Does yours in a way that keeps you from temptation? Is your heart treasuring God's word in such a way that you desire to praise him and learn from him and about him? Number three, from verse 13, which says, With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. When you treasure the word in your heart, you'll want to speak of God and his word to others. Remember the words of Jesus in Mark 16, 15 and 16. And he said to them, go. He didn't give a choice, did he? Jesus doesn't say when it's convenient, when you don't have anything else to do. He doesn't give us a choice in this matter. If we think this isn't a commandment for us today, we need to look at it again. We have a group that has gone out in the McMinnville, Tennessee area, a group of our young people, and they are going there to teach God's word, and that was done. And we have a group now in Nicaragua that is going to teach God's word. But it's not just for those who may we look at it and say, well, that's something they can do. This is something that all of us as Christians must find a way to do. And there are so many different ways and so many opportunities that we have to do this. And if you're not aware of them, please talk to someone who is doing it 
and see how they're doing it. Jesus said, go into all the world. Doesn't leave any part out, does it? Preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Colossians 1, 28-29, writing to that church there in Colossae. He says, we proclaim him. I think that is such a great statement for us to read. We proclaim him. Sometimes we think of preaching as from this avenue, from the pulpit. That's not what Paul's talking about. He says, we proclaim him. How, Paul? We admonish every man and teaching them every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. I would suggest to you those who say, it's just not for me, don't understand the power of God and the power of his word. It's not me that saves people. It's not you that saves people. It's not the group that's going to Nicaragua that saves people. It's not the teens that save people. It's God's holy, powerful word. And we must understand that and hide it, treasure it in our hearts for what it is. God's word. Number four, when you treasure the word in your heart, this is one of the best things about it. You overflow. You overflow with joy and rejoicing when you get it. When you get what God is trying to teach you, you can't help but feel the joy that God is giving you. The joy that is in Jesus Christ. The joy that is in the gospel that he has given to us. Earlier, Phil challenged us before we took the Lord's Supper, where is our heart? And so right to do that. Where is your heart when it comes to his word? When you have it treasured in your heart in the correct way, you can't help but feel happy. You can't help but be joyous. You can't help but know you have the hope of heaven and have that joy in your heart that that reward is waiting for you someday. In 119 and 111, he says, I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I asked you a moment ago, what is the joy of your heart? Are they the testimonies of God? Is it okay to have other things that bring you joy in your life? Absolutely. But nothing, nothing should bring you more joy than to know that you stand in the right relationship with God and that you meditate and, and want to know more about God and his word. In Jeremiah, the 15th chapter in verse 16, listen to the words of the prophet. Your words were found and I ate them. That may sound kind of strange to us, but I want you to think about that. He devoured them. He wanted them so badly in his life that he gave an analogy that he ate them so that they were a part of him and he knew the words of God. It says, And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. There's some authors that I like to read their books. And I anticipate when a new book is coming out. And then that book comes out, and I literally devour that book within a couple of days. And then I'm kind of saddened because the next one won't come out for several months. How much more should I be doing that with the Word of God on a daily basis? 
devouring it, reading it, studying it, knowing it. And when the preacher preaches and he names off a verse, I'm already ahead of him knowing what's going to be said. I can enjoy the sermons even more in that manner because I know maybe where he's going to go with that. Or I think of another verse that he possibly could have used. That's meditating on God's Word. That's knowing God's Word. That's treasuring God's Word in your heart. Jesus said in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 44, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Are you willing to give up everything for God? Understanding how important his word is in your life or should be in your life. Or do you let other things keep you from it? In Acts 8, in verse 39, the Ethiopian nobleman had been baptized. And it concludes with verse 39 when it says, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. When we treasure the Word of God and we accept the salvation that can be found in it, we should be rejoicing every single day. If you've been baptized, I want you just for a moment to think back to the joy that you felt. I've been blessed to be around many that have been baptized, and I see the joy in their face, literally in their entire being, and how happy they are at that moment. And I pray for them to remember that and to dwell on that over and over again. And we should as well. When we treasure the word of God in our heart, we should be rejoicing over and over again that we have the salvation that can only be had through God's holy word. In verse 15 of Psalm 119, the Bible says, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. Then later, in James 1 and verse 25, the Bible says this, But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. I want you to understand the words of James as they bring those words from the Old Testament into context that we need to be looking at God's word the same way intently when we look at it and understand it and know it then we'll want to obey it we'll be blessed in what we do James tells us when we obey the law of liberty the law of freedom from the sin and the trials of this world we can be free from that Jesus has told us that in John 8 and verse 32 You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Free from what? From the sin and the shame of sin. Then again, in Psalm 119 and verse 16, the Bible says, I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. When we study something over and over again, we begin to learn it, and we begin to know it. Perhaps you remember doing this when you were in school and you had a test and you studied hard so that you would know the answer. How much more should we be wanting to know the answers that give us eternal life? The more we concentrate and treasure the Word of God in our hearts, that's what we're studying for. It's not some test that some man's going to administer to us at some time, but rather it is when we will stand before judgment day and do we know God's word in such a way that I lived it 
I did what God wanted me to do. I obeyed the commands of God. And the only way I can do that is if I know them. I must study his statutes. I must know them and not forget them. We are always in time of need to do what God says. In Proverbs, the third chapter, and verse 1, the wise man said, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. So the question then becomes, what are you doing about it? We can read the words of the psalmist and we can know what it is that he says to us. But are we doing it? Are we treasuring his word? Are we treasuring it in such a way so that we will not, so that we can rather resist the temptations that are out there for us? So that we can praise God as we should and learn from him. So that we can go out and teach others about God and his holy word. Are we treasuring the word of God in our heart that allows us to have this joy that God would have us to have? God desires for you to give him his heart. God desires for you to want to please him. Do you desire to please him? Or do you let the cares of this world take over your heart? Are you letting other things get in the way and your heart becomes a crowded place and God is pushed to the side. I suggest to you that our whole heart, our entire being, needs to be focused on God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Treasuring Him. Truly wanting to know Him. In an intimate, close relationship. So that you are willing to go to Him every single day and listen to him from his word and then speak back to him the things that are hidden in your heart, the things that you wouldn't tell anyone else, but you will tell the God of heaven and admit to him that you've made those mistakes. God has given us a way to be right with him. He has given us a way because he sent his son. And his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, will cleanse us and make us pure and white before God without any blemish of sin. But it's up to us to obey it. God's part is done. It is complete. It is finished. But our part must be done also. We cannot be right with God just because God has given us a way to be right with him. We must accept that gift of salvation by being obedient to him. If you've been studying and you know what it means to be baptized into Christ, and that that will cleanse your sins and put you in that right relationship with God, and get, the Lord will add you to his body, to his church. If you understand that, we can make that happen today. But if you have been baptized and you're no longer treasuring God's word in your heart, you also can make that right. If you have any need at all, please come now while we stand.